I'm watching the Joker in the theater for the first time. I'm liking the movie well enough. I'm, I'm liking it. Then it gets to the talk of scene. And you feel the entire atmosphere in the theater change. The thing that's profound is this. Robert De Niro's talk show character is not a movie villain. He doesn't deserve to die. He's just an asshole. Yet, while the audience in the movie theater is watching the Joker, they want him to kill Robert De Niro. That is subversion on a massive level. They got the audience to think like a lunatic and to want something that they would never, and they will, and they will lie about it. They will say, no, I did it. And they're liars, they did it. <laughs> I feel like a sizable chunk of online film discourse would simply cease to exist if we could just find the answer to this one seemingly simple question. When exactly does depiction become endorsement? This singular question has been at the heart of arguments surrounding art since forever. For films specifically, we're talking 1915 at the absolute latest, as detailed by Kristen Hunt's JSTOR Daily article, The End of American Film Censorship. The fear, of course, has always been that what's fictionally depicted in films will plant the seeds of morally corrupt ideas into the minds of those who watch them, thus informing their worldview and behavior in reality. This fear caused an extremely concerted effort in 1930 to censor Hollywood filmmaking in order to try and prevent even a single film being produced that would, quote, lower the moral standards of those who see it. Hence, the sympathy of the audience shall never be thrown to the side of crime, wrongdoing, evil, or sin. This censorship came in the form of what was known as Hays Code, which targeted the usual suspects. Things like crime, sex, vulgarity, suggestive dancing, making fun of religion, not treating the American flag with respect, depicting childbirth and white slavery. You know, the typical stuff, with some special exceptions thrown in for things like interracial marriage or trafficking women so long as they were depicted in, quote, good taste whatever that means. And while Hayes Code eventually died a slow, painful death by 1968, the fear over the potential dangerous impacts of movies has never gone away. We're still having the exact same arguments about many of the same subjects to this day. And personally speaking, I've seen plenty of people in my comment section who would, for the most part, love to see Hayes Code make a comeback. And the reason I've seen those comments is because I've poked the bear on more than a few occasions. The phrase I usually throw around is, I don't believe that exploring taboo subjects in art is inherently equivalent to endorsing them. Key word there being inherently, because just saying depiction does not equal endorsement isn't exactly true. Filmmaking is used to endorse things all of the time, whether we're talking commercials like David Fincher and Heineken, or Spike Jones and the Apple HomePod, or there are certain biopics and documentaries that have seen their fair share of criticism for being factually skewed, unabashed endorsement of certain people or ideas, and we can even get more extreme here with wartime propaganda like Triumph of the Will, or Battleship Potemkin, or Walt Disney's entire World War II run. And we can even trace this back all the way to the origins of Hollywood with Birth of a Nation, which for monetization reasons, I'm not exactly allowed to get specifically into what that film is about. 
but let's just say that in that case, depiction was definitely endorsement. But listing all of those examples basically brings us full circle back to the original question. Like, when exactly does depiction become endorsement, and by extension, how can we tell the difference between the two? And here's where I'm about to nosedive any chance of success this video had, and just be straight up with you and tell you that I don't have an easy answer for you. In fact, I barely have an answer at all. Maybe if I had one, I could sleep at night. Instead of trying to, I don't know, save the world or be the arbiter of truth, I'd rather try something a little bit different and instead attempt to illustrate for you why that question is damn near impossible to answer. And I want to do that by taking a look at the film Joker. But before I talk about Joker, I have to talk about Martin Scorsese. I'm Martin Scorsese. Hello. But probably not for the reason you'd likely assume. The most common criticism of Joker is that it's simply a ripoff of Martin Scorsese films like Taxi Driver or The King of Comedy. And while I think that's kind of true, it's not the reason why I want to talk about Scorsese today. I'm Martin Scorsese. The reason I want to talk about Marty, am I allowed to call him Marty? Uh, <laughs> screw it. The, the reason I want to talk about Marty is because I feel like his career and filmmaking philosophy will both provide a solid foundation for what we will be exploring in this video. First off, when it comes to depiction, it's important to note that out of Scorsese's 26 narrative feature films, 19 of them are rated R, and that's very much on purpose. We're talking about people getting turned to Swiss cheese, we're talking 500 swear words in a single film, we're talking enough white stuff to kill a horse, and unflinching looks at violence and abuse, I could go on and on. Basically from the beginning of his career, Scorsese set out to be provocative. Sometimes my father would say, we'd talk about a film and then with his brothers or aunts and uncles and somebody would say, well, they can't do that in a movie. Oh, no, they can't, no. They can't show that or they can't do that. And I was, as a child, I was wondering why not? Why can't we tell the stories they're not supposed to tell? But unlike many other provocateurs, Scorsese provokes not for attention, but with intention. Scorsese typically makes films that challenge the audience to not only exploratively contend with the fictional world he presents to them, one that's often a reflection of reality, but he also asks the audience to contend with themselves. And one of the most powerful tools he has in his arsenal to help achieve this is empathy, which just for the sake of clarity, I'm just going to borrow Jane Stadler's definition of cinematic empathy from her article, Empathy in Film. Empathy is an emotional process that occurs when audience members perceive, imagine, or hear about a film character's affective and mental state, and in doing so, vicariously experience a shared or congruent state. The thing about Scorsese is, though, is that the people he often asks you to empathize with aren't good people. Take, for example, Jake LaMotta from Raging Bull. We understood that people didn't like him, and even the crew turned out. I didn't know until later, why are we making a film about this guy? He's a horror. And, but we stayed with it. This man may be this way, but still, he's a human being, he's got a heart, he's got a soul. By the end of it, he finds some kind of peace with himself and maybe the others around him. I think I was going there to try to find peace in myself. Or perhaps for a better example, we should look at the film that Joker takes heavy inspiration from, Taxi Driver. Now, Taxi Driver is about a man named Travis Bickle, a sociopath who repeatedly displays very disturbed antisocial behavior and ultimately in the film lashes out at the world around him in incredibly violent ways. Yet the film asks you to empathize with him and also asks you to consider his place in our world. As Scorsese puts it, We kept thinking in terms of the character and his loneliness and his acting out. Not condoning the acting out, but he does act out. And yet, an empathy with him. 
which is really tricky. Ultimately, what stayed with us was the psychological and emotional state of that character. As we know now, tragically, it's a norm. Every other person is like Travis Bickle now. And when it comes to how all this works in execution, I mean, this is Martin Scorsese we're talking about here. He is lauded as one of the greatest living filmmakers mostly by pretentious white film bros like me. But still, the fact remains that Scorsese is so precise with the craft of filmmaking that he can convey meaning and character empathy through camera work alone. I felt that when he made that phone call, it was so painful, we shouldn't witness it. So the camera should track away. It should move completely to a hallway. And in the hallway, you think somebody's coming, but nobody's gonna come. Nothing's gonna happen, we're all alone. And at the same time, there's a sense of anxiety on uh, the viewer. What's gonna happen in the hallway? There's another thing too, where the taxi pulls up at the beginning of the film into the uh, taxi garage. Normally it goes this way and the camera would pan with it and it, it stops. Well, as it came in, I went the other way. And as we rested, the car came in and stopped. Every shot, as much as possible, was uh, designed to be slightly disconcerting, but ultimately, ultimately satisfying. That being said though, all the intention, exploration, and empathy that he layers into his films can actually be a bit of a detriment in the context of the depiction versus endorsement debate because it leaves his films wide open for interpretation. When you're watching a Scorsese film, unless you have director's commentary turned on, you're not always going to have Scorsese in your ear guiding you through the film and telling you how to feel about everything. At a certain point, you're left up to your own faculties. It's up to you to decipher the provocative images that are being presented to you, which is why Scorsese has always been such a strong advocate for instilling visual literacy in audiences especially in audience members who are younger. You need to know how ideas and emotions are expressed through a visual form. The grammar is panning left and right, tracking in or out, intercutting a certain way, the use of a close-up as opposed to a medium shot, what is a medium shot, what is a long shot, and the different kinds of lighting, and how you use all these elements to, to make an emotional and psychological point to an audience. Film, the image can be so strong, not only for good, for good use, but also for bad use. Look at World War II. Look at the, the great uh, director, Lenny Riefenstahl. Look at her triumph of the will. Film is very powerful. Images are very powerful, I should say, and we have to start to begin to teach younger people how to use them. But at the end of the day, even if you're extremely film literate, you're still going to be viewing a film through your own lens, AKA your own set of biases, experiences, etc. And in doing so, what you take away from a film especially one by Scorsese, can often say just as much about you as it can about the film itself. Take for example, Wolf of Wall Street, a film recounting the real life excess and debauchery of Jordan Belfort, who basically made a ton of money scamming people and generally being a terrible person. Now, Wolf of Wall Street garnered a bit of controversy upon its release, not only based on what it depicted, which was like constant drugs and scenes and abuse for three hours straight, but also for supposedly, in the process, glorifying all of it. Here's what Scorsese had to say about that. Wolf of Wall Street, for example, I only learned the other day from uh, an interviewer who said, you're not aware of the war of Wolf of Wall Street? So I said, what are you talking about? So well, there was a big screening at Paramount, the picture, and the, for the critics in New York, apparently, I was told this, there were two camps. One camp that loved the picture and the other camp that was furious, saying I didn't take a moral stand on Jordan Belfort. Mm -hmm. And one of the critics from the other group that liked the picture said, do you really need Martin Scorsese to tell you that that's wrong? Right. Yeah, that's well said. That's well said. Yeah, that's well said. You really need yeah. him to tell yeah. you that's wrong? Well said. He knows it's wrong. But all that controversy has never really stopped Scorsese's films from garnering positive reception. Even his most controversial films have fared pretty well critically, and in some cases, financially. 
So it seems that for better or worse, Scorsese will always be a centerpiece in many a cultural conversation surrounding film as an art form, perhaps none more so than the great depiction versus endorsement debate. So with everything I've talked about in the back of our minds, I want to go ahead and analyze the opening scene of Wolf of Wall Street. Now, I've used this clip before, and it's also truncated for copyright reasons, whatever, you don't care. Here's the clip. The world of investing can be a jungle. Danger at every turn. That's why we at Stratton Oakmont pride ourselves on being the best. Stability. Integrity. Pride. <laughs> In that clip, what we saw depicted was footage of Wall Street and an American flag, um, also the brass bull, and of course, um, you know, other strong animals like a bear and ultimately a lion walking through the halls of a brokerage firm, all accompanied by uplifting strings and piano as words like integrity and pride are narrated on top of it all. All of it is displayed as zoomed out or cropped in, depending on how you want to see it, leaving plenty of black edges around the screen. Until, of course, the lion dissolves into a company logo, and then boom, smash cut, we're in said company as people are screaming and cheering and throwing around money and actual human beings at targets for cash prizes, all as a man in blue in the center is like frothing at the mouth, egging them on. Now, as we know from Scorsese's own words, the intention here was not to glorify what's being portrayed, but instead to shock the audience with it, and in doing so, make a point about it. The whole idea of untethered capitalism, this is the spirit of it. Anything goes because you're making money, it doesn't matter. Right away, first three or four minutes of the film, you can see right away this is gonna be something unexpected. Uh, like every other shot, something shocking going on in a way or supposedly shocking some of your films people are punished for their sins and in wolf of wall street they are celebrating oh no they become i mean like in a sense uh, you know uh, uh saying that it did uh, politically the country they, they elected him no because it's about kill go get the money lie do anything you want you can't do anything to me i have all the you know when you say listen i don't have to pay taxes to a certain extent because i have smart lawyers right it's true it's, in, it's legal, doesn't mean it's right, but it's legal. So, I mean, that's the thinking right there in that movie. And he does this in execution through something called juxtaposition, which is basically just highlighting the stark contrast between the romanticized, upstanding view of this Wall Street firm as portrayed in the opening commercial and smash cutting that into the insane animalistic behavior that actually takes place within the walls of that company. What this is doing, in my interpretation, is shattering the illusion of not just Wall Street, but by extension, America and capitalism, conveying to the audience that the spoils of unimaginable wealth are not awarded on humanitarian, moralistic grounds, but often are awarded for exactly the inverse. To get that level of wealth, you need to be greedy, corrupt, and you need to dehumanize others. It is a powerful opening statement, one that should frame the rest of your viewing of the film, basically telling you not to buy into Jordan Belfort's lifestyle or his deception, but to instead look at his actions not with admiration, but with skepticism and probably disgust. But of course, as we all know, that's not how a lot of people viewed the film at all. <laughs> Along with Kendrick Lamar's swimming pools being used as a drinking song at parties, uh, <laughs> The Wolf of Wall Street is one of those pieces of art that since its release has really made me feel like I'm from the Baron Steen Bears universe. I mean, I'll admit the film did appeal to me a lot as a teenager on just like a sensory level, I guess, but it, what I've always seen as a cautionary tale 
many others, especially at that time, saw it as an aspirational goal. And I don't mean that in just a positive way either of like, I want to be just like Jordan Belfort. I also mean that in a negative way, in the sense that people thought that the film was trying to promote this ideology or like sell you on this lifestyle, which gives me cognitive dissonance that I do not even know how to handle. And that is a position that we as Americans especially find ourselves culturally in a lot, where the intent of art directly contradicts how it's being used or what people are taking away from it. I mean, even with Wolf of Wall Street, if we take interpretation out of the mix, there seems to still be at least a correlation that Jordan Belfort became a more well-known and successful figure after the release of the film, even if Scorsese's intent was to basically condemn America for ever making him successful in the first place. And this creates an incredibly difficult scenario for artists like Scorsese, where simultaneously what's happening is people are becoming understandably more skeptical of ambiguous or explorative filmmakers and are also calling on filmmakers, especially provocateurs, to use their platform more responsibly and take a harder stance, condemning the bad things that they're portraying and asking them to not attempt to empathize with someone like Travis Bickle or Jake LaMotta or Jordan Belfort so as not to make the real people like them feel validated. And I am the last person on YouTube who should ever call someone out for that because I am not immune. I am basically only known as the person who tore the Netflix Dahmer show a new one for being fundamentally unethical. And of course, though, the catch 22 is that like if something like Hollywood censorship, like Hayes Code, were never effectively overturned by the Supreme Court, then yeah, the Netflix Dahmer show would cease to exist, which is a huge win in my book. But also, my precious Scorsese senpai wouldn't have a career. And in fact, if, if those restrictions were even just enforced on a cultural level, that would really only seek to stamp out the creative spark that makes Scorsese's work so powerful and important. I like keeping that youth and I like yeah. keeping an open mind, but an open mind means less restrictions and these days, um, uh, for good reason yeah. and for good intent, there's a great deal of a closing of the mind. It isn't as simple as suddenly you go into a world that's all morally unjust and everybody's very serious and you know, they're all villains. Right. No, it's the guy next to you. It's you, even. There's a Bob Dylan quote from Chronicles, his book. I might butcher it a little bit, but he says, if your ability to uh, inspire, be curious, or observe is compromised in any way, then your creativity is compromised. That's right. Yeah. And that's the danger of today, too. Yeah, because yeah. what, there's an answer to everything? Yeah, an answer and there's a, understandably a sensitivity, mm -hmm. you know, which has to be balanced with art somehow, mm -hmm. because uh, the art should be free. And it is exactly in the middle of this uncomfortable, contradictory cultural limbo where a film like Joker ends up. Joker is a film about a man named Arthur Fleck, a working class clown for hire with dreams of hitting it big in stand-up comedy who lives with and cares for his physically slash mentally ill mother. Nothing in life can go right for poor old Arthur Fleck. He's beaten and robbed in the street. He is denied access to his medication and therapy after social services funding is cut. He loses his job and finds out he was adopted and abused and that his entire relationship with the woman of his dreams was nothing more than a psychotic delusion. And to add insult to injury, he's publicly mocked by his hero, television comedian Murray Franklin. But over the course of his misfortunes, he finds a new calling in life. 
murder. He kills three rich men on a subway car and inadvertently becomes a political symbol for the working class people of Gotham City. He also kills his abusive mother, as well as the man who got him fired, and in one last act of vengeance, kills Murray Franklin on live television. He is also indirectly responsible for the death of Thomas Wayne, the wealthiest man in Gotham, who may or may not have been Arthur's biological deadbeat dad. Arthur is arrested for his crimes and is being driven to jail, but in the ensuing riots, is freed by people in the street. Arthur proudly stands atop the wreckage of the police car, finally living his dream of basking in the glory of an adoring crowd. He still ends up in an asylum, but seemingly as a hero to the people. The end. All right, good night, sweetie. I love you. Sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Mwah. Okay, so how are we feeling? <laughs> All right, so clearly I'm not putting my best foot forward here as an analyst because truth be told, Judging a film based solely on what it depicts is one of my least favorite forms of media analysis ever. And here's why. If you only look at Joker in the most literal way possible based on what it depicts alone, it seems like a pretty open and shut case that depiction is equal to endorsement. Not only because Arthur is handsomely rewarded with praise for his actions, but because those actions are seemingly justified by his misfortunes. It seems on the surface that the film is telling you to not only feel bad for Arthur, but that violent retribution is a viable pathway to success. But it lacks something major, and that's context and nuance, and credibility. What this method of analysis attempts to do is bypass, or in some cases, encourage its audience to actively ignore all the other processes we have that help us individually come to our own value judgment of a film. In this case, whether or not we think it's endorsing what it's depicting. And keep in mind, this isn't a linear process either. It's all of these ideas feeding into each other. It's more of a spectrum, I guess. Like, we're not talking about this or this. <laughs> we're talking about this. The reason this method of analysis is so popular and frequently used is because just drawing a singular line from one end of the analytical spectrum right down to the other requires much less of everyone involved, and often in doing so, leaves everyone feeling as if it's more true, because the truth is always simple and easy to understand, right? But I have to believe, for my own sanity more than anything, that generally speaking, people are smarter than that, and that pretty much anyone could see that simply recounting what a film depicts has about as much analytical depth as reciting the plot section of the film's Wikipedia article, and that the context of how something is depicted can drastically impact how something is engaged with or perceived. And in fact, we actually have some scientific evidence that tangibly, observably proves this within the realm of movies. In an article published in 2014 titled Cry For Her or Cry With Her, context-dependent dissociation of two modes of cinematic empathy reflected in network cohesion dynamics, a team of researchers listed on screen here used fMRI scans of the brain to observe how people empathized with characters in two similar scenes, one from the film Stepmom and the other from the film Sophie's Choice. The clip from Stepmom shows a mother informing her two children that she has contracted a likely terminal illness, whereas the clip from Sophie's Choice displays a mother having to choose which one of her children's lives to spare and which one to unalive in Minecraft. Basically what happened is they had the participants watch the two scenes, and as they watched, the researchers observed the different regions of their brains that are commonly associated with 
two different types of empathy, one called embodied simulation, which basically just means sharing in a character's affective or mental state from like a first person perspective, and theory of mind, which is more of a third person perspective where a character's mental state is like, it's determined by essentially projecting beliefs or desires onto the character, if that makes sense. And fascinatingly, what they found was that these two modes of empathy can play against each other and even override one another, depending on the context of the scene being presented, which they hypothesized has something to do with the logistical differences between the two scenes, because while they're both thematically similar in showing a separation of mother from child, in one, death is presented as an unchangeable fact, whereas in the other, it's presented as a choice. But the great irony of this study is that they presented the clips out of context, which, you know, who's to say how the participants might have felt about each scene had they watched each film in their entirety. But of course, that would be pretty impractical for a study like that, unless you were able to find people willing to be strapped to a chair with a brain scanning machine on their head for four hours. It, like that meme of the monkey doom scrolling Twitter, except you couldn't give the participants the Crab Rangoon or the Adderall or the drum and bass music because those would all really interfere with the test results. What the f am I talking about? The point I was trying to make somewhere in all of that was that the test provides empirical evidence for how important context is in our mental processing of what's being depicted. If I were to just show you the intro to Joker of him getting beaten and robbed in the street, it would probably be pretty easy to feel bad for Arthur, but if I immediately followed that up with one of the heinous acts of violence he commits, that would probably throw a wrench in the works. And this only gets more and more complicated as you start to learn that films communicate ideas through well more than just plot. Even if I were to provide for you a very clinical, comprehensive review of every single event in Joker, if I didn't then take the time to account for how all those moments work together as part of a broader cinematic language, then what I would be doing, as my out of context clip of Tarantino at the beginning of the video states, is effectively robbing Joker of any of its power. And in effect, I would also, in my opinion, nullify any argument that I would then make about the film's ability to persuade its audience to glorify or empathize with someone like Arthur Fleck. I'm sorry that this section was so, in the grand scheme of things, like brief and uneventful. It seems like it should have been more important given the big question surrounding this whole video, but it's kind of the problem with this level of analysis is that it just, it provides no room for interesting discussion or exploration at all. It's extremely surface level. So I'm just gonna move on uh, to the next section, which is like, why were any of these events depicted in the first place? This is where we start to get into the real meat of things. One of my favorite and least favorite aspects of film analysis, determining intent. It's one of the biggest reasons why behind the scenes featurettes and interviews with creative teams behind our favorite films are so valuable to find out not only how something got made, but why it was made that way. When attempting to determine creative intent, one of the most obvious people to point to is the director of the film. When somebody has a question about what a film means, that's usually who they go to for answers. Joker is co-written and directed by Todd Phillips, who did a ton of press before, during, and after the film's release, and it's all pretty illuminating. There pretty much wasn't a single question I could throw at the film that the man himself hasn't already answered, much to his displeasure. Uh, yeah, he pointed out to me that, um, yeah, I mean, he was okay. I mean, he read the script, but no, I was going to say something, but I, I, it tends to be that anything you say on this movie gets turned into something, so then I go, just be careful. 
<laughs> when it comes to one of the central questions surrounding this video, that being, is the audience supposed to empathize with Arthur Fleck? The answer is obviously yes. Not only given the great lengths the creative team went to to put the audience into Arthur's perspective, or the way that Arthur is constantly portrayed as a victim, both of which we'll talk about later, but most importantly, because Todd Phillips has explicitly stated this. Is it possible to feel bad for a monster without being a monster yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important, and I, I think ultimately the movie's uh, somewhat about that, and it's and it's about empathy in general, and having empathy for maybe those that are less fortunate or yeah. those that are left-footed with the world like Arthur is. I think a lot of people feel um, left-footed in this world, sort of out of step, and certainly Arthur was that way, and the movie ultimately um, somewhat is about empathy for people like that, and what happens maybe if we don't treat people with empathy. But when it comes to whether or not that empathy is supposed to be an endorsement of the character, Todd Phillips has stated numerous times that this was not his intent. You know, Arthur's actions in this movie are abhorrent by the end. You're not supposed to be rooting for him. So yeah, the idea was to sort of do it almost as an origin story of a hero, but you know, where you're really rooting for him and you feel for him and then there's a point and it's different for everyone where you're like, I'm out, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> The movie's a little tricky in some, res in some regards because he is a villain. He is a, he is a sociopathic narcissist at the end. So I think the, the twist of the movie is that we make you fall in love or feel for this guy. And as that mask chips away, this villain is actually revealed. He's not meant to be a hero at the end. So the disturbing and unsettling thing about the movie is you're going, God, I was rooting for him the whole time. Even at the end, I was rooting for him. But he is a villain at the end. There's a bit of a twist in it. And, and I hate the word trick, but a, a trick on the audience in a way of like getting you to love this guy until you can't love him anymore. So the next logical step, of course, is to ask, what exactly was the intent of getting the audience to empathize with Arthur then? Like, broadly speaking, what is this film about? And to that question, you get a ton of different answers. For starters, it seems like Todd Phillips is pretty leery of defining his film for the audience at all. I've spoken to many 21-year-olds that think it's a great villain origin story for Joker, and I've spoken to other people that realize the movie's really about the power of kindness, and that's something that we wanted you to feel. But it's a hard question to answer because you kind of want people to have their own experience with the movie. I mean, there's a lot going on in the movie, as you know, you saw it, and uh, I, don't like to, I don't like to define it too much, but, but there's a lot you can take away from it. It's hard to do these because you don't want to define it for people, and you don't want, because there's a lot of ways to interpret the movie, and I hate as the director to define it for people if that makes sense. But when he does decide to give explicit details, he most often says it's about empathy and kindness, not only to challenge the audience to empathize with someone less fortunate like Arthur Fleck, but to make a broader statement about empathy and kindness or the lack thereof in the world and how that will breed, quote, the villain we all deserve. We set out to make a film that illustrates the sort of lack of empathy in the world. And the idea is that when we treat each other with this kind of discourse and this kind of dismissiveness, you get the villain you deserve. Couple that with mental illness, childhood trauma, a lack of love, and these are kind of the recipe for someone like Arthur in this movie. So the th I would say those three things, childhood trauma, lack of love, and this kind of erosion of empathy in society um, is are definitely strong undercurrents in the film. And he also talks about how the film was intended to be counter-programming to the bog standard comic book movie, how they were essentially sneaking this dark 70s inspired character study through the Hollywood comic book system to get it to an audience that may otherwise not receive it. I really wanted to do a deep dive sort of character study into one person, but they don't get made a lot in the studio system and it's tough to get people to show up to them. And, and so then I sort of had this a little bit twisted idea of, well, maybe you can get it made if you made it about one of those guys, meaning, you know, so it was a little bit what you said, smuggling it through. I don't have anything against comic book movies, but they were never really my thing as a film fan. And I just was staring at a billboard for a comic book movie that was across the street, and I was thinking, 
boy, that really is where the business is headed. They all have to be like that. And maybe you can do it a different way. And I was thinking about the movies I grew up on, grew up loving, the movies of the 70s, Scorsese, obviously, Sidney Lumet, and thinking, what if you did one of those movies like that? And it really just started there. I also think people kind of get tired of having processed food that's already kind of easy to go down. And I think we kind of, in the movie business, we're guilty of doing it because, well, it works. This is what they want. And, you know, I think that it's okay sometimes to challenge that idea. When we were tr struggling to get Joker made, which sounds funny because it exists in the superhero world, but it's really not one of those movies. In fact, it mm -hmm. was greatly inspired by the works of Martin Scorsese and Sidney Lumet. We had a really hard time getting that film made, which seems insane today. Now, seeing how well the movie's done, we spent a year at Warner Brothers, and I saw emails literally where they said, does he realize, meaning me, does he realize we sell Joker pajamas at Target? <laughs> and so, is that true? doesn't the movies come first, the pajamas come second? <laughs> oh, like, are the pajamas yeah. dictating no, the movies? No. And he also dropped these bombshells. There's a lot of things this taps into, whether it's social services, mental health, it's, you know, this movie's about a lot of things. It's about, like I said, the power of kindness, it's about the loss of compassion across the world and what that does to a society. It's about childhood trauma. I mean, this movie's also an argument to me for universal health care. <laughs> All these things are sort of couched in this dark movie. Was there some particular incident that happened in the real world that you, that was like, that really yeah, upset me? Yeah, it has everything to do with Donald Trump, honestly, and just sort of like the way he was, I mean, it really did. Now it would be very easy to just brush this off as him messily playing to the crowd and shifting the goalposts so he can avoid taking responsibility for what his film really means. I think that's a bit uncharitable, but it's at least understandable. Now I know this isn't exactly like a hot take or anything, but I've always felt that a healthy amount of responsibility for what's depicted in art should be placed on the artist, as well as the commercial entities that help fund their art. I've always seen this as more of an instinctive and internal process on behalf of the artist, like they should do the work to make sure that they clearly understand their intent and that they're executing it to the best of their ability. But still, some care and consideration for others is warranted in a lot of cases. But at the same time, I do agree with Todd Phillips when he says that movies are allowed to be complicated. I think it's complicated movie, but I think movies and art can be complicated. Um, sometimes they're meant to be complicated, and, and I think that's a good thing. Joker isn't about one thing. It's not intended to get one reaction out of the audience. It's about all of the things that Todd Phillips listed and probably even more. And if that's not confusing enough, everything gets way more confusing when you consider the fact that the director is not the only creative voice behind a film, especially not in the case of Joker. Movies are made three times. They're made when you write them, they're made when you shoot them, and they're made when you edit them. And so I always think the, the editor is always my, my last writing partner. It's the last draft of a screenplay. With Joaquin, we had so much good material, as cliche as that sounds. And there's pretty much 14 different versions of Joker as a movie. Meaning like, if you made a left here instead of a right, it would be that movie. And as far as the composer, Hilder, Hilder Gunodotter, Hilder's music, you know, here's the thing. I think it's the heartbeat of the movie. I think it's all of what Arthur's, you know, internal, it's all the music in Arthur's head, basically. It's all Arthur's heavy shoes music in the beginner, beginning and Joker's operatic, you know, lunacy at the end. While Todd Phillips does describe Joker as a deliberate film, he also goes to great lengths to highlight how explorative and collaborative the process was, especially with lead actor Joaquin Phoenix. Joaquin and I spent six months talking about the movie before we shot the first frame of the movie. So all we did was collaborate and talk about um, ways to do scenes, approaches to the character, tone, talk about telling him how the movie's gonna look. Um, so yeah, no, this was pretty much for me the most intense collaboration I've had working in movies. It was exciting to me to see, no matter how um, detailed and how well we wrote a script, for him to come in and make it his own. That is literally what people mean, I think, when they say the magic of movies. That's the magic part, you know? The way I do it, it's jazz, not math, comedy. And But I really, it's actually how I make movies. It's not, it's not 
written in stone and there's a very loose atmosphere and I love feedback from actors and somebody on the crew could have a great idea and we keep it open. So there are times where we would go onto set and we would talk about a scene for a couple hours and not shoot because we were trying to figure something out. Or sometimes we would start shooting a scene and halfway through the day after shooting for two hours go I think we're we're going in a, we should go in a different direction like this isn't this isn't the right way to to do this scene Todd and and, and Larry Shear, the cinematographer would really allow the whole set to be available to me the in the entire room wherever we were shooting in so if I if it felt like we might want to move over into another area for part of the scene we were we were had the freedom to, to do that and I, I do like working that way and Joaquin Phoenix has been very outspoken about how the filmmaking process is more collaborative than we could probably even fully comprehend. What I love about filmmaking is the collaboration, um, not just with the, the filmmaker and the writer, which is obvious. Anybody that I come in contact with while I'm working can influence and shape the character. Um, and that's always really exciting to me. I don't think audience members are aware of that where it's talked about. There's all these different brilliant artists that come together who are all focused and committed to, to helping me find the character. Take, for example, the bathroom scene, one of the most iconic scenes from all of Joker. This scene was actually almost entirely improvised. You know, that scene where he's dancing in the bathroom is scripted as an entirely different scene. And we went in to shoot that scene that day and he's supposed to go and he gets in, he's gonna wash his makeup off and, and hide the gun under a thing. And when me and Joaquin were on the set and we are just like, eh, this doesn't really feel like the Arthur we've been filming now for four or five weeks. So we sat around for 45 minutes while, you know, the crew's outside, just thinking about other possibilities. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I ended up playing him a piece of score from Hilder, who is our composer. And I just started playing the score from off of my iPhone. And he started doing this dance. And we just was like, wait, that's the Much scene? <laughs> Called in the operator? Much right, wow. amazing. Now, the question becomes then, who gets to decide what that scene means? Is it Todd Phillips? Is it Joaquin Phoenix? Or is it Hilder Gunadotter? Who gets to decide that? And this is why I said at the beginning of this segment that trying to determine creative intent is one of my favorite and least favorite aspects of film analysis. Because while it is incredibly fulfilling and insightful to pick the brains of those creatively involved with a film, it also has the unfortunate byproduct of making people extremely conspiratorial, essentially viewing movies the same way a detective views a crime scene, you know, scanning for evidence, interrogating witnesses, speculating motive, etc., which is a lot of fun, but I don't know if we should be treating movies as if they've committed a crime. Especially not when, like I said, we have a broader set of tools at our disposal to determine what a film means and whether or not it's endorsing the ideas it's depicting. Intent is not everything, and as the old saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. For a lot of people out there, it isn't so much what you intend to do, but rather how you intend to do it. I missed, are you f***ing kidding me? So I said earlier that Joker goes to great lengths, creatively speaking, to put you into Arthur Fleck's mind. Pretty much every aspect of the film reinforces this intent mostly through Joaquin Phoenix's wonderfully emotive and nuanced performance, but this is also clearly communicated through the cinematography, not just in terms of light and color. It's an example of the blue light that bathes the city at this time of day. And when he gets into his home, that's the first time we're introduced to some warm, comforting tungsten light. It's probably the warmest, most gentle uh, light that's in the whole movie. He's going to go into an environment in which now he has to perform with all these red lights that have shades over them. And you can barely see the people. The idea is focusing on Arthur's struggle. This slightly dirty but little bit cooler spotlight was in the interest of putting him in a very harsh, almost an interrogation light, overexposed, certainly not something that you can hide from. And here he was exposing himself in a really human way. But 
also visual metaphor and even lens choice. We shot this in Newark, New Jersey, and here's Arthur down there, this little clown in this big imposing world. I wanted it to feel really oppressive and Gotham is always over Arthur. The heavy um, steps of, of Arthur and the climb that he has to do literally on the steps that he has to go home. When I was uh, younger, my mother used to describe me as somebody that had heavy shoes and I always liked that and I told that to Joaquin, this idea that every step is, like you said, the weight of the world on him and the, the steps obviously you know, represent sort of at the end his descent into madness when he's truly found himself. Um, and yeah, I mean, the steps are a metaphor for that, for sure. Not, not so subtle one, but yeah. Towards the end, dancing on the stairs, um, we see it in 24 frames a second, which is what film normally is. And his movements, his dance movements seem choppy and uncoordinated. And then Todd then shot it in slow motion um, and he appears graceful. I thought it was like a, a great way of kind of showing uh, the subjective reality and the objective reality. Shooting uh, with um, shallow depth of field, which I isolates Arthur. Well, that was just something we had talked about really early on is um, I just loving the way it looks and feels and it, the way it conveys isolation. Joker's character development has to do with a character that is in a big world, Gotham, people all around but he's living this isolated, lonely life, almost like he's invisible. Allowing us to see the space he's in was really important, but I also wanted a lack of depth of field to really isolate him. Certainly in his apartment, and in a lot of scenes where we're dealing with just the intimacy of him, and he's not dealing in a world at large, we gravitated much more to, to uh, wide lenses. Arthur's perspective is even reinforced through the tiniest of visual details, like how the horizon line of certain shots will be ever so slightly tilted in certain scenes, just to give the viewer a bit of an off feeling. And this perspective is also heavily emphasized by the sound of the film, not just its musical score, but also its sound effects mixing. Talk to me about that first few minutes and what's happening and how you guys worked with director Todd Phillips to set the tone of the film. There isn't like a super clear point of focus right um as it kind of leads in but once we get to sort of the camera landing on arthur we needed to figure out a way to sort of allow your focus to shift onto him and what is he doing and you know kind of like delve into there a little bit of what's going on in this guy's head you yeah. know and you know mm -hmm. right away from that first sequence like Spending time in Arthur Fleck's head is not going to be a pleasant experience, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was one of Todd's directives from the beginning was, I want you to feel like you're there with Arthur. So we did tons of work and tried to make the audience feel that they were always sitting in the middle of this with Arthur. The scene where uh, at, towards the end of the movie where Arthur is waiting behind the curtain to go out on the Murray show. And so all of the sound that's happening in the real world is the Murray show. It's happening, it's there, but Arthur doesn't really care about that. So even though it's happening, the balance of how that score plays against uh, you know, Robert De Niro out there talking and, and the audience reacting and all that is played in such a way that you understand it's not that important. And you're kind of with him, even though this big thing is way more activities happening right there because that's all in his head. I mean, the score for this movie um, is basically always scoring him, right. you know? And his feelings and his, where he's at. I mean, musically <laughs> it was it was kind of, it was f for me, like his, his character was so, you know, he's so direct, he's so just like kind of, you know, simple at heart and just really trying to understand what's happening. And he's just like, why don't I fit in? Why don't I fit in? Why don't, and you know, then he starts to understand more and more about what's happened to him. And I, I think all of that required like so much simplicity. And so all the, all the melodies are, are just like, almost have no harmony. It's when all of the elements of him, you know, where he's understood all of his elements that are like, you know, coming together and his anger and frustration has kind of just taken over and he's become this this multi-dimensional character, which which he, he didn't really start out to be. And then I was just like, okay, and then harmonies, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then 
<laughs> okay, sorry to just abruptly rip the Band-Aid off of this love letter to all of Joker's technical achievements, but now I have to get to the part of the video that's really going to piss people off. In my humble opinion, the best film criticism stems from a critic's attempt to recognize the intent of a film and weigh that against its execution, which means that now I have to become a movie critic. And everyone hates movie critics, especially fans of Joker. But I swear to you that not only will I critique Joker in good faith, but then I wouldn't be critiquing Joker at all unless I felt it was really important to the overall conversation being had here. Because a film's ability to endorse an idea and persuade an audience to buy into that idea has a lot to do with how effective it is at executing the idea that it is endorsing. So without further ado, here's my review of Joker. If you look at the top 50 highest grossing films of all time in the US, what you will find is a fairly expected mix of family and or IP driven films, over 50% of which are now owned by Disney. But among those top 50, the film that feels most out of place to me is Joker. Because while it is a massive IP driven film, the same as any Marvel or Star Wars film, it takes an intentionally different approach. If there's anything comic book movies face heavy criticism for in general, it's how formulaic and homogenized they feel. They're all very safe. And while Joker also feels familiar, at least in its landscape, it's also very bold and dangerous. It dares to ask the question, what if a comic book movie were a real movie. In all seriousness though, and I am being serious here despite how ridiculous this is going to sound, I think Joker is one of the most challenging films we have in that entire top 50. But I don't mean that fully as a compliment, because in the grand scheme of cinema there are obviously a lot more thought-provoking and challenging films out there, some of which Joker takes heavy inspiration from. But for a comic book movie audience, Joker might as well be assaultive. It is a surprisingly complex film that takes a huge leap of faith, because unlike many other films of its ilk, it doesn't offer just simple escapism, but instead challenges its audience to look at themselves and contend with their reality. It's ironic, I think, that people are reacting to this movie because they go to a comic movie expecting a, a not reality, an escape, and here we are saying, no, actually, this is what this looks like. This is what this world looks like. This is what violence looks like. This is what mental illness looks like. This is what a city in decay looks like. Look at it, feel it. And, 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 and today in a way, uh, what's hard about this movie is what's great about this movie. Yeah. This is mostly achieved through an unsurprisingly powerhouse Oscar winning performance by Joaquin Phoenix. But it's also facilitated through an incredibly moving and also Oscar winning score by Hilda Gunadotter, as well as immaculately crafted cinematography by DP Lord Schur, and a gentle but steady directorial hand from Todd Phillips. And when all of these different elements perfectly coalesce through various moments of the film, it feels profound and impactful, giving its audience an unflinching look at things like mental illness, childhood trauma, urban decay, and class struggle, as well as the horrific yet realistic violence that is bred from those things. It dares you to feel something for someone who, in any other context, especially in a different comic book movie, would simply be a villain, deemed unworthy of empathy. It attempts through every moment to put you into the perspective of someone 
who is extremely mentally unwell, and it just makes you sit there in it, despite how uncomfortable and unnerving it can be. It also leaves quite a bit up to interpretation. It poses all sorts of difficult questions, but leaves the burden of answering them mostly on you, which again, for a film of its kind, is extremely ambitious. Bringing something that at all resembles Taxi Driver to a billion dollar comic book audience, I just can't stress enough how much I respect that. And even taken on its own merit, I think Joker stands as a pretty good film overall. But I feel as though the film can often crumble under the weight of its own ambition. My problem with Joker is that it's a film that wants to ask very hard-hitting questions and make all sorts of revelatory observations about the world around us today, but at the same time, almost down to a fundamental level, in execution it can't help but constantly remind its audience that it is indeed fictional. Take, for example, the many ham-fisted ways the film portrays how unfortunate Arthur's life is, sometimes literally beating you over the head with it. There is nothing, not one thing, that can go right in this man's life. Everything that happens to him is comically awful, which on one hand is brilliant because it allows the film to blur the line between comedy and tragedy. That was interesting to Scott and I, is just sort of exploring this thing is, is my life a comedy or is it a tragedy? How adults see me is a tragedy, how kids see me is a comedy, but really um, it's both for, for Arthur and for ultimately Joker. You know, the movie is a study of tragedy and comedy and that scene is sort of a combination one it kind of goes through like four major emotions where you feel for arthur and then he commits this horrible vile act and then you're in fear for gary and then there's this sort of comedy of gary trying to get out and there's <laughs> love at the end this is sort of the, the craziest scene in the movie what we're saying there with the water coming out of the flower flower <laughs> is he's still joker he's still there to make people laugh. He's still seeing comedy in this moment of pain. Showing how, in the exact same light, Arthur's life can either be viewed as harrowing or hilarious in a comedy of errors sort of way. But on the other hand, what this also does is it makes Arthur's life feel contrived. It frames Arthur's life in a very blunt and simplistic way that feels like hitting the same sad note over and over and over. And it doesn't help at all that the film's goals of realism and contemplation are often hampered by the fact that it has to be a comic book movie at all. Todd Phillips has said that one of the most fun and rewarding creative challenges he faced when writing Joker was reverse engineering the character, taking everything we know about him and running it through, quote, as realistic a lens as possible. Everything we've come to know about Joker over the last how many years we've seen him in comic books and movies, how do you take that and run it through the, a real lens? So why is his hair green and why is his face white and why does he have a laugh? So it was like a backwards engineering in a way. What do we know about Joker? Well, he has a laugh. Well, he has white face painted and green hair and all these sort of things that we've come to know about Joker and then running them through as realistic a lens as possible. For Scott Silver and I, who, who wrote the script together, it was all about running everything through as realistic a lens as possible. We go, well, what if he's a clown and he wants to, you know, so everything was just about taking the character that we knew and running it through as realistic a lens as possible. And it was actually a fun kind of backwards engineering project for us when we were writing it. But this approach, again, not only does it make the film feel a bit contrived, but it also makes it to where all of its realistic depictions only work in service of fiction, 
of mythos. As soon as I feel like I'm engrossed in Arthur's perspective, and I'm really starting to contemplate the heavy existential questions the film is posing at me, in comes a Batman reference to remind me that, oh yeah, none of this is real. Which, obviously, even if the film were just called Arthur and had nothing to do with Batman or the Joker at all, it still wouldn't be real, you know, like Taxi Driver is every bit as not real as Joker. But the goals of Taxi Driver pretty much start and end with being an emotionally effective and contemplative piece of cinema. Whereas Joker has that exact same goal, but also the competing goal of giving an incredibly famous comic book character an origin story that explains everything we're already expected to know about him. Which, ironically enough, was the reason why Martin Scorsese, director of Taxi Driver, ultimately stepped away from producing the project. I thought about it a lot over the past four years, the Joker. You're right, it is influenced by uh, Todd, Todd was told, told, me, Todd yeah, told yeah. me some money. This is yours. I, I don't yeah. know if I want to, you know. But anyways, personal reasons why I didn't get involved. But the, I know the script very well, so that it has it's really energy and incredible. Uh, Markeem and all that. Sort of so you have a remarkable work. But uh, for me, ultimately, I don't know if I if I make the uh, uh, how should I say the next step, which is to this character developing into a comic book character. Mm -hmm. You follow? Yeah, yeah. Uh, develops into an abstraction. That doesn't mean it's bad art. It could be, but it's not for me. But on that same token, much like with tragedy and comedy, the film's blurring of fiction and reality is also one of its greatest strengths. Out of all of its attempts to, as Tarantino put it, get the audience to think like a lunatic, there's one aspect of the film that has gotten more attention than any other. And that's the way that it immerses you in delusion. A lot of the conversation surrounding Joker upon release got really hung up on the what's real and what's not line of questioning. Do you think he actually did these things? Do you think this is real? Do you think it is all in his head? Have you ever said publicly like what your internal thoughts are? You know, I think sometimes you feel it's real and sometimes you feel it's it's fiction, but sometimes it, you know, it, it doesn't really even, I think it doesn't even matter. It, that, that doesn't matter, really. Okay. <laughs> do, do you have a take on it? Or do you like? Yeah, I do have a take. I actually, I believe it happened. There are some people that watch this movie and think none of it happened. When he's in that white room at the end and he's saying, she's saying, what's so funny? It's a joke. You wouldn't get it that he actually imagined the whole movie and that's not even, you know, Joker. And somebody said that to me, a friend of mine, a filmmaker who I showed it to, and I said, oh, that's interesting too. Did, what, what are we taking from it? What really happened and what, what didn't? What really happened? I mean, I've heard people, including myself, that believe that the last scene, he's, everything that led up to it is, it is in his own world, in his own mind. It's, yeah. it's and please do not answer. No, I would not But it is answer. totally I was open. just about to, too, no. <laughs> I mean, it's a liberating thing to write a movie based on an unreliable narrator, and it's doubly liberating when it's, it's Joker, so it's almost like doubly unreliable. You don't really know. There are a lot of aspects where you have to question as an audience, is that real or is that in the head of the character that we're learning about? Not to be immodest, but what I do love about the movie is the questions you have at the end mm -hmm. and that I've shown the movie to many different people, friends of mine, when we were editing and they all had different theories like like you're saying. Yeah. I kind of like that. I think it's 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 a, one of the fun things about filmmaking and making a movie like this, particularly you're making a movie called Joker. It's he's already an unreliable narrator yes. because he's Joker. As Todd Phillips states, Joker is an unreliable narrator. Thus his story gives you a fair amount of reasonable doubt when it comes to damn near anything depicted in it. This sometimes happens in incredibly obvious ways, like the twist reveal that he imagined an entire relationship with the woman down the hall from him, but sometimes it's in more clever ways, like at the beginning of the film where Arthur is beaten and robbed for his everything must go sign. Later on, his boss confronts him about this event and asks a very logical question. I got jumped. Didn't you hear? For a sign. It's bullshit. It's a 
something that makes sense. And it's also displayed through the many hiccups in details that happen throughout the film, like the constant, did I say that? That happens in conversations with Arthur. That's what you called me on the show, a joker. Do you remember? Did I? I don't know. Why don't you ask Randall about it? It was his gun. What the f are you talking about? Stop talking out of your ass, Art. And perhaps this is too heady of thinking, but I couldn't help but notice that this particular scene between Arthur and his therapist is really odd when you actually break it down. Because twice in the conversation, they will veer from the topic at hand to get into a very disjointed, emotionally charged monologue just to veer back to the topic at hand. And I understand this is a common trope of written dialogue, but the way that this scene in particular utilizes it is very interesting to me because it starts with Arthur's therapist trying to get out some bad news to him, which causes Arthur to go on his monologue of all I have are negative thoughts, you know, the famous line. But then his therapist just straight up ignores this and instead just delivers the bad news that she was trying to get out to him the whole time. They've cut our funding. We're closing down our offices next week. But then Arthur just sort of soaks that in and while he's doing that, his therapist then goes on this extremely out of character rant that the camera angle even changes. It, it, it just feels odd and out of place. They don't give a shit about people like you, Arthur. And they really don't give a shit about people like me either. But then Arthur doesn't even reply to this. He just instead replies to the bad news he was seemingly actively ignoring before. When am I supposed to get my medication now? Who do I talk to? And the point I'm trying to make in this observation is that you could easily edit out the parts of this conversation that feed into Arthur's victimhood in a way that wouldn't be obtrusive to the flow of that conversation at all. In fact, it might flow even more naturally. Arthur, I have some bad news for you. They've cut our funding. We're closing down our offices next week. The city has cut funding across the board. Social services is part of that. This is the last time we'll be meeting. When am I supposed to get my medication now? Who do I talk to? And this brings up an incredibly important question in this whole depiction versus endorsement conversation. One that effectively recontextualizes Tarantino's Joker got the audience to think like a lunatic quote. What if the attempts of the film to get you to empathize with Arthur in a beating you over the head type of way were actually a presentation of a simplistic and false narrative that Arthur tells himself in order to justify his actions. I mean, there's so much self-pity, Arthur. You sound like you're making excuses for killing those young men. Which, to put it bluntly, is really fucking cool. It creates an additional layer of complexity that not only begs the audience to engage with the film more using their critical faculties, but to also come to their own conclusions, which can be incredibly revealing in a lot of ways. But again, it also works as a bit of a detriment because this what even is reality approach can often break suspension of disbelief. Because if the film isn't sure whether or not anything in it actually happened, then why should I care? Like, what incentive is there to emotionally invest in a film that, in many different ways, insists on its fictionality? Well, personally speaking, I still think there's a lot to be gleamed from it. Again, despite everything I've said, Joker is still a good movie overall, one that is powerful and well executed for what it is. It's just that sometimes what it is holds it back from reaching what it wants to be. But for the sake of this video finally continuing to move forward, 
I'm just going to take everything that happened in Joker at face value, in so much as saying that everything depicted in it was real, at least in the context of the world of the story, and that the film, despite my feelings to the contrary, was consistently effective at putting the audience into Arthur's perspective. Does that empathy then directly translate to endorsement? Does that then mean that the audience condones Arthur's actions? Well, depends on who you ask. One of the most common missteps made in this whole debate is treating the audience like a singular entity, as some sort of monolith of thought, rather than a collection of individuals with their own beliefs, values, experiences, and cognitive processes that they bring with them when they enter the theater. You'd think, with a strong grasp of visual literacy and a wealth of information about Joker's artistic intent and technical execution available to us, that we'd all be able to unanimously agree on what the film means. Uh, wait a minute, no you wouldn't. I'd never sit here and try to argue to you that every single interpretation of an artistic work is equally valid, but I do at least think that they are all possible, which leads to a lot of conflict between various members of the audience over different aspects of the film. Earlier in this video, I made a pretty prescriptive statement that the intent of Joker is to get you to empathize with Arthur. And while I said that based on the explicitly stated intent of those creatively involved, and also based on the way they implemented that intent into the technical execution, here's what I didn't account for, and that's that Empathy is not the same experience for every individual person. I mean, even the study I cited in the depiction section of this video made a clear delineation between theory of mind and embodied simulation, or what we've come to understand from a more broad psychological perspective as cognitive and effective empathy. And Professor Barry Scout makes a similar argument within the realm of the philosophy of film for these two different views being the assimilation view and the identification view of cinema. It, it's a lot of technical jargon. I'm sorry, that's a lot of this section of the video. Uh, but basically, to make a long story short, I put a whole bag of jelly beans up my... And no, oh, I'm kidding. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, getting back on track. To make a long story short, basically what it comes down to is experiences of empathy not only being different from person to person, but also differing in certain contexts. Like... One audience member may be viewing the characters in a film as an outside observer, thinking to themselves things like, what would I do in this situation? Sort of projecting their own beliefs and values onto these characters and making judgments that way. Whereas another audience member may be attempting to put themselves directly into the shoes of a character or multiple characters, attempting to think what they think and feel what they feel, while another audience member might pass back and forth between these two different states, depending on the film or maybe even depending on the scene within a film. In Werner Wirth and Holger Schramm's literature review, Media and Emotions, they attempt to guide the reader through the different theories of how emotions are processed, especially in response to media or at least the different theories available in 2005 when it was published. And one of the things I found most fascinating about it was this idea that what we think of as concrete emotions, what you might call gut reactions or instincts, are also very much subject to our own cognitive processes. Things like the context of the situation that the feeling arises from, as well as our own individual behavioral tendencies and even our own memories of similar events or feelings. And later in the same review, they go on to summarize Dolph Zillman's effective disposition theory, which proposes something similar and was specifically made to be applied to narrative plots like films. 
And basically what it says is that protagonists in films are subject to spectators' moral judgment and are either approved or disapproved, that audiences are observers of a media event, and if our own observations lead to empathic feelings toward likable protagonists whose actions are approved, then we expect a very specific continuation or ending of the film, aka while the audience in the movie theater is watching the Joker, they want him to kill Robert De Niro. And to pivot to a different source, there's a really great piece of anecdotal observational research in the introduction to Ill Effects, the media violence debate, that illustrates this pretty beautifully. So basically, this researcher is at a shelter for the unhoused and is basically observing a group of unhoused people who are watching the movie Die Hard, which, if you don't know, it's basically just about this one guy versus this whole team of terrorists in this giant building. And at first, the unhoused people are elated to see Han villain Hans Gruber and his team destroy this giant corporate building. But then they sort of start to warm up to the protagonist, John McClane, because it's just this one lone wolf guy against this whole team of terrorists. But then, <laughs> the second that John McClane starts working with law enforcement, this group of people get so pissed off that they just turn the movie off. <laughs> and it's a really funny story, but I think it proves a valuable point, and that's that you bring as much of yourself to a film as it brings to you. To bring everything I've just said back to Joker, you know, the film that this video was supposed to be about, while feeling awful for Arthur Fleck, given everything that he goes through, may feel like something that just happens by default, like an instinct, or in some ways, at least in my opinion, may feel transparently manipulative, our ability to empathize with Arthur is still very much informed by our own personal experiences with or biases against people like Arthur, or our own personal accounts of the situations he finds himself in, as well as our own perceptions and moral judgments on his life as a whole, i.e. what's real and what's not, or can his actions continue to be justified. Even if someone is to feel awful for Arthur on a profound level and in the heat of the moment wants him to kill Robert De Niro, as Tarantino observed in the theater he attended, that feeling may be fleeting and may be met with another feeling like shame or disgust upon immediate reflection. And that's where we get into the concept of reappraisal, which Worth and Schramm define as the point where the aforementioned appraisal processes are reevaluated because the framing conditions, such as the situation or the possibilities of coping, have changed. Basically, Think of this scene from Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. Never commit to an interaction that won't be casual or mellow. Your test was today. Ugh, test, I've been there. Rachel's been diagnosed with leukemia. They just found out. Your test was today. Ugh, test, I've been there. Oh God. Reappraisal is something that Joker utilizes a lot, especially in its portrayals of violence. The violence in the film is often senseless, but at least from Arthur's perspective, justified for one reason or another, and the film asks you to reconcile those two conflicting ideas, to reappraise how you feel about Arthur with each new passing scene, asking yourself things like, how does the level of brutality in Arthur's actions affect their ability to be justified? Does him being abused or delusional absolve him of accountability? Or does it only make him more dangerous? At what point do I stop rooting for this man? And as Todd Phillips states, that point is different for everyone. You love him and root for him until you can't root for him any longer. 
Now that point where you gotta stop, where you stop rooting for him, is different for different people. You may have rooted for him till the very end, <laughs> and that's fine. I did too. <laughs> but some people, there's a, there's definitely a line where they turn, and it's just different for everybody. But the concept of reappraisal can even be applied to Joker as a whole, because. The experience of a film doesn't live and die by the first viewing, it doesn't end as soon as the credits roll. How you feel about a film and what you think it means can change wildly with time as you gain more knowledge or life experience, as you self-reflect, or even when you do something as simple as just watch the film for a second time. In 2019, walking out of the theater having just seen Joker, I never would have given it the amount of credit that I did in the review you saw in this video. I was part of the crowd that was easily writing it off as a Scorsese ripoff. For the most part, I, I thought it was okay. But now that it's been several years since its release, and I've thought about it more, and I've rewatched the film and done a ton of research in preparation for this video, I've gained an entirely new respect for it, especially for the ways that it utilizes violence as a means to challenge its target comic book audience, who has grown so accustomed to violence being trivialized. To me, I thought, isn't that a good thing to put real world implications on violence? Isn't it a good thing to take away the cartoon element of violence that we've become so immune to? So I was a little surprised when it turns into that direction that it seems irresponsible, because to me it seems actually very responsible mm -hmm. to make it feel real and make it have weight and implications. Again, I'm gonna reference the introduction to Ill Effects by Martin Barker and Julian Petley, where they summarize the 1997 research by Annette Hill on the consumers of violent media and how these viewers build what they call portfolios of interpretation, which basically just shows the ways in which viewers of violent media become experienced and knowledgeable in their understanding of on-screen violence and how to properly contextualize it. They also highlight David Morrison's Defining Violence from 1999, which shows that the context of violence, which is then usually judged on aesthetic or moral grounds, greatly impacts an audience member's overall perceived level of violence in a piece of media. In both of these highlighted studies that I've just talked about, not only clearly illustrate that viewers of violent media are still able to separate fiction from reality, but that they also, while watching, still have their own agency and are able to draw their own conclusions. But I guess the, the moral panic, the, the fear over depiction and endorsement is usually pointed at the less discerning audience member, like a child. And that's where the research of Hodge and Tripp, as well as David Buckingham come in, also summarized in Ill Effects, which display that children are also able to clearly delineate fiction from reality, albeit not as keenly as an adult, in that they are also able to view and process films with a similar level of literacy to any other film viewer. But perhaps the most biting quote in the entire introduction, the one that hit me the hardest, was from Greg Philo, and it said this, it would be wrong to see people as being totally dependent on such messages, as if they were simply empty vessels which are being filled up by news at 10. To accept and believe what is seen on television is as much a cultural act as the rejection of it. Both acceptance and rejection are conditioned by our beliefs, history, and experience. And I promise that this is the last thing I'm going to blatantly borrow from Ill Effects, but there was this really excellent essay later on in the book titled, The Worrying Influence of Media Effects Studies, which highlights the many issues with how media effects studies are conducted. Issues that I think can be more broadly applied to the depiction endorsement discourse. 
things such as tackling social problems backwards by rushing to media being to blame instead of looking at other probably more pertinent influences, or assuming superiority to the masses, and treating children as inferior, or the thinly veiled conservative ideology at the root of it all, and of course, a general lack of understanding of how films even work. But what good is any of that stuff from ill effects when so much about the world and the way that we consume media and information has fundamentally changed since 2001, the year the book was published? Can we really accurately say all the same things about a generation of people raised on the internet? And Generationally, I'm right between Millennial and Gen Z, Zillennial or whatever the hell it's called, and one of the most common observations of both groups is how we constantly infantilize ourselves. We were both raised on a steady diet of media, information, and rampant capitalism, which leads us to strongly identify with what we consume. And this leads to the broader observation that essentially, I guess people think that because of technological dependence, that we're just blank slates with no real agency at all, that we just take in whatever we consume with no critical thought to speak of. So all that being said, I, I do want to take a moment and just speak personally here and say that I empathize with Arthur Fleck. And I do so very much in an embodied, first person type of way, you know, oh, he's, he's literally me. But I don't condone his actions because of that. That's exactly why I find Joker so challenging and interesting is because it makes me wrestle with that cognitive dissonance more than pretty much any other film of its kind would ever ask of me. So if it is observably possible for someone as average and chronically online as me to both feel for Arthur and condemn his actions, then why exactly were so many people worried about the potential dangerous impacts the movie might have? Ladies and gentlemen of Chicago, please welcome to the stage legendary comedian, Joker. Stop cheering. Stop cheering. Last time I got a crowd this riled up, there were riots in the streets. <laughs> hey, did, did you guys see they made a movie about me? It's good to know there are no movie critics in the audience tonight. <laughs> Seriously though, for as much as you guys loved it, uh, seeing the mixed critical response, it, it really kind of bummed me out, you know? But then I thought of something that I learned from my hero, Murray Franklin. God rest his soul. <laughs> you know, you can tell a few bad jokes at the beginning. You know, no one's gonna remember that. But you have to make sure that your last one knocks them dead. <laughs> I've tortured you long enough. Let's get this thing over with, shall we? So Joker met a fairly mixed critical reception upon release, but it was nominated for 11 Oscars, winning two of them, and the audience in general seemed to really love it. It's been really interesting to see how different groups of people have taken to the film, especially now that it's been several years since its release. And it's especially interesting to look back at how many reactions to this film were based on preconceptions. Things like it's a comic book movie, or it's directed by the hangover guy, or it's potentially dangerous in what it's depicting, all of which were hot button topics during the press tours for the film. We do have a warning this morning from the US military about the new Joker movie, alerting service members that there could be potential violence at theaters that are showing the film. Some have criticized the film for romanticizing Gotham's clown prince of crime. 
Some fearing the film may become an inspiration for real world criminals. Were you worried before the film came out that there might be some violence? No, because I just didn't subscribe to that, quite frankly, bullshit thing that was happening in the media where they just pick a movie every so often and declare it, mm -hmm. it means something that it doesn't. I suspect it's also because it's very close to the bone in the sense that Joaquin gives such a powerful performance that it feels quite real. And there's something a little scary about that at a time when we have a proliferation of guns in our society and, right. and, and lots of sort of random violence. I do agree and understand that we are treating the violence in a very realistic way. We felt like it's actually a very responsible way if you portray violence in a realistic way and show how disgusting and ugly it can be. If you really watch the movie, you go, why would this movie incite violence? And, and they go, well, because you're making a movie about a type of person. You're getting us to sympathize with a type of person or you're shining a spotlight on a type of person that doesn't deserve to be shined a spotlight on. And I, I would go, it's almost as ridiculous as like, you know, climate change deniers, you know, people who deny climate science. Isn't this sort of the same thing? Like, are we just gonna pretend that these type of people don't exist? Are we gonna pretend that we haven't broken um, a social contract with a certain uh, group of people in this country and that there are ramifications of it? Is it really so bad to say we're failing as a human experiment and maybe we should shine a spotlight on this. It, it, to me, it was, it was so surprising that, again, there was so much pearl clutching about the movie from people that you wouldn't expect it from. How this kind of emerged between you and Scott as you're writing this, um, as uh, maybe even an unconscious reflection of the times we're in, it's that, it's that part that, I, that I'm particularly interested in because we think of you as a comedy director. You know. Okay, right. But I mean, no, it wasn't an unconscious reflection. It was it was what we set out to start when we started writing it. I've never been a fan of, of, of pigeonholing people. And I, I hate when it was always when it's been done to me of like, well, why does the guy from The Hangover get to do this? They have conventional wisdom in their brain more than you would think. Oh, no, no, I, what, I agree. What is, what is it supposed to be? That's right. And you're supposed to be this over here mm -hmm. and this over here. I and think that goes even. the rules. Yes. We broke the rules. I think that even goes for me as a director. The blowback that I noticed was, how did this guy get to do this? Not, not pull it off, but how did he even get to do this? As if movies get made by Warner Brothers coming and hiring you to do it. That's not the way I've ever made a movie. Nobody asks asked us to do the film. But there's always like, why would they hire him to do, why would they hire the hangover guy to do this? It's like, that's just not how it works. I didn't imagine the level of discourse that it sort of reached in the world, honestly. The film is the statement, and it, it's great to talk about it, but it's much more helpful if you've seen it. You know, and, and so much, <laughs> there's been, it sounds insane, but there's there's been so much conversation around the movie by people that haven't seen the movie. I mean, we had think pieces being written about this movie where people proudly wrote, I haven't seen the movie, I don't need to see the movie, I'm not gonna see the movie, and then they would write two pages about why the movie's <laughs> bad. <laughs> the problem with this film, what I didn't expect was the discourse that happened before they saw the movie, and I found that to be a little bit too much. <laughs> that level of criticism hampers creativity in a way, in the future, I'm not talking about my movie, I'll be fine, but it, even even the junior high school art teacher knows that's not the right approach to it, do you know what I'm saying? What we've gone through on this picture, you know, with Joker was, was pretty rough through the media that the movie is, you know, made to inspire violence or to, um, uh, all, all the things that really weren't in there for me and Joaquin when we were making the film. People come at it as a, as a target and start talking about, again, why it's dangerous. And really when we go, we made a movie about childhood trauma and the loss of compassion and yeah. lack of love in a, in a person's life and what that might do. But everybody always wants to talk about the, the spark and not the powder, but the yeah. film's really about the powder, what makes that happen, do you know? Now, I think it's safe to say at this point that Joker didn't cause any major catastrophe, but it also did resonate with specific audiences that I don't think it was supposed to. And, you know, even through its empathy and relatability, it probably wasn't taken quite as seriously as it wanted to be, especially not if the amount of memes it spawned or anything to go by. It doesn't really seem like a broad consensus of Joker can be reached other than like, eh, it's pretty good. And uh, other than that, you know, 
the the pop culture explosion surrounding Joker may have died out, but the does depiction, especially empathetic depiction, equal endorsement line of questioning that surrounded the film upon its release does live on just in the form of other flavors of the month. And the reason why that will never change, at least in my opinion, is because this line of questioning, the goal is almost never to be explorative like we have been during this video. It's more so to find not just an answer, but the answer, the one definitive, easy to understand truth at the root of everything. And this goal gives us all sorts of unreasonable expectations. Unreasonable expectations like film should only have one meaning that should be able to be derived from the most obvious aspects of said film. And that, you know, that meaning should be able to be clearly and succinctly communicated into a microphone or camera in an easily digestible piece of content. And that, you know, we should just boil films down to, you know, a comic book movie or a Scorsese ripoff. That'll make Joker easier to understand. And we want to vilify people like Arthur Fleck because it's so much easier than contending with what the film is presenting to us, which is that we not only play a part in creating him, but that in many ways we reflect him, not just through funny memes, but in our everyday lives. And when that thought makes us uncomfortable or something tragic happens in the world that slightly resembles what is depicted in the film, then we just want to point at that film or the person who made it and blame them for it. And while I do think that there are some seemingly simple things that we could apply systemically that would improve our everyday lives, things that Joker itself advocates for, like uh, addressing income inequality or providing universal health care. I don't think that is depiction equal to endorsement will ever have a simple, easy answer, because if it did, we would have stopped arguing about it hundreds, thousands of years ago. Or maybe, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we just love arguing, you know? Maybe we just love it so much. We just love having the same arguments over and over and over, and it never gets old. And us YouTubers especially love it because not only can we capitalize on it through money, but through sweet, sweet attention. And if someone out there were to find the the definitive truth, the answer, then that dopamine gravy train would stop running entirely. And we wouldn't want that, would we? Speaking of getting mad for fun, uh, Todd Phillips did an interview with The Rap where he said that he thinks outrage is a commodity and that it has been for some time. And he was especially shocked during the discourse surrounding Joker how easily the far left could sound like the far right when it suited their agenda. And while I normally loathe the enlightened centrist, I kind of have to agree. Pointing fingers and boiling things down and being puritanical, th those are all staunchly conservative mentalities, but they're ones that have unfortunately seeped their way through all different levels of the ideological spectrum, especially in people my age or younger for whatever reason. If we insist on boiling things down to their essence, then I want to end this video on a question, another seemingly simple question, that naturally arises from this kind of thinking, which is, can a film that endorses an inherently unethical person or idea still have artistic value? And forgive me for pulling a bit of a Midwest goodbye and going on a tangent right at the end here, but I really want to make it clear exactly what kind of film I'm talking about. Because a film that is undoubtedly endorsement, that is remarkably similar to Joker, does exist. In fact, it came out just a short month after Joker. And that film is called 
Honey Boy. Honey Boy is a semi-autobiographical film written by actor Shia LaBeouf. The film is about a character named Otis, aka Shia LaBeouf, and it's basically a slice of life film that bounces between Otis's time in rehab and the events of his childhood. And through his exposure therapy, Otis is essentially trying to recount and process the traumatic experiences he faced as a child, mainly to do with his emotionally and physically abusive father, played by Shia LaBeouf. His father also, coincidentally, strangely enough, uh, used to be a rodeo clown. See? Told you this was relevant. The film very much touches on similar themes to Joker, things like mental illness or childhood trauma and abuse and trying to empathize with someone who is extremely morally complicated. And the film in many ways was sort of an exposure therapy for Shia LaBeouf himself because he had to literally put himself in the shoes of the person who abused him and, and attempt to empathize with that person. And at the time, it, it really hit me deeply on an emotional level. It, it meant so much to me for many reasons, but, but also to do with the fact that Shia LaBeouf was a childhood hero of mine. And it was so nice to see this childhood hero that I grew up with grow up with me and, and be so emotionally raw and honest in such a public way. At least I felt that way until I learned the Shia LaBeouf's source of inspiration for this story. My source is that I made it the f up. Yeah, as it turns out, a lot of the events depicted in this so-called autobiographical therapy exercise were actually complete fabrications made with the explicit purpose of making Shia LaBeouf seem tragically sympathetic. And this isn't me getting conspiratorial here. This is straight from the horse's mouth. Honey Boy is basically like a big woe is me story about how f my father is. And the story that gets painted in Honey Boy is like this dude was like abusing his kid all the time. My dad never hit me, never. But that wasn't my narrative because it didn't position me as like this wounded, fractured child that you could root for. Now I'm at Sundance and I'm like thinking that I'm the ultimate manipulative master. You know, my dad was gonna live with this certain narrative about him on a public scale for a very long time, you know, probably for the rest of his life. And on top of all of that, it was on the set of this film where Shia LaBeouf met FKA Twigs, who he would later go on to emotionally and physically abuse. And divorced from that context, the film is very beautifully directed by Alma Harrell and does feature a career-defining performance by Shia LaBeouf. It's a deeply emotionally impactful film, but it's one that only serves to be an undoubted endorsement of a self-admittedly deeply unethical person, and it's also a film whose existence, unfortunately, in a cruel twist of irony, helped foster the same abuse that it was attempting to emotionally unpack. I mean, there's no excuse for abusing your partner or destroying your father's reputation in such a sadistic way to just embolden your career. There's no way for me to use this tiny platform that I have to recommend a film like that. But... <sighs> This is where I am bound to lose most of you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, if you made it this far, please hear me all the way out. I still think Honey Boy has artistic merit, just not always for the reasons that it intends to. Honey Boy is a powerful statement about sociopathy and narcissism and how fictional narratives and character empathy can be weaponized against an audience. It, it is undeniable proof that depiction can be endorsement. Now, does that make everything that happened as a result of the film existing worth it? No. <laughs> What do I look like to you, some kind of psychotic clown? But is it still valuable as a piece of art? Yeah, it is. And I'm tired of pretending it isn't. None of it's real though. Yeah, well, <laughs> there it is there, isn't it? None of it's real. It's more valuable that way. You know, stone crumbles, people die. 
That's the real world. The only thing that's going to live on is stories, fables, dreams. And we can apply all the same thinking to Joker. Like, let's just say, fuck everything I said in this entire video. Joker is definitely endorsement, especially of the idea that violent retaliation is justified and worthwhile. And let's say that the entire billion dollar box office unabashedly supports that ideology as a result of seeing the film. Does that rob Joker of its artistic value? Again, ethically speaking, yes, obviously. But artistically speaking, I think that the film would still, in that case, be a powerful statement about what kind of world we are living in. But please bear in mind that the only reason I have the privilege of saying that is because any time, historically speaking, a film of that kind has existed, I have never been a target of the violence that that fictional film then inspires. You know, it's at least not ostensibly speaking, which means just based on my appearance, which isn't normally like this. It's normally like the fusion dance between Ron and Rufus from Kim Possible. <laughs> and I don't think that you should ever discredit the people who would be targets of said violence from condemning the existence of films of those kind. It, you just, they would just be wrong to do that. I, this is why attempting to boil things down in this way, especially in this conversation, just, it just doesn't work. Any attempt feels reductive because art, much like existence, is messy and morally complicated and legitimately dangerous, and that terrifies me, but <laughs> it's also why I love it, and I don't want to see that change necessarily, at least not for films. Uh, <laughs> life, yeah, maybe that could change. So I guess if I have to leave you with a message, I'd like to advocate for a world in which we can recognize the incredible power that film has in our culture and where we can be considerate and responsible with that power while also at the same time not allowing films to impede our critical faculties or our ability to self-actualize. Two things can be true at once because everything is defined by nuance, and until we learn to be okay with that, the discourse will live on in perpetuity. But hey, that's life. I used to look upon myself as rational and strong and loved was just a word in silly songs But from that cursed day when you crossed my way All my confidence was gone I'm bewitched, bewildered, and utterly alone There's no need telling me I am but a fool Cause your beautiful face Will not ever be smiling for me And you won't say All those little words I am longing to hear Those whispers at night but it's some things are just never meant to be Knowing it